This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 96. Coming up on Space Time. Four billion year old planetary crust found under Western Australia. A new hypothesis for the origins of Earth's water. And it works in the movies, but would suspended animation or stasis really work for long distance space flight? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists have identified a 4 billion year old piece of the Earth's crust, roughly the size of Ireland, underneath what is now Western Australia. The discovery, reported in the journal Terra Nova, is among the oldest segments of the planet's crust ever identified. The oldest currently known slice of planetary crust on Earth is the Canadian Shield on the eastern shores of Hudson Bay, which has been dated to 4.3 billion years. That's just 300 million years younger than the planet itself. And 200 million years after the giant Thea impact in which a Mars-sized planet slammed into the early proto-Earth, eventually giving rise to the Moon. The only oldest stuff originating from the Earth are zircon minerals dating back some 4.4 billion years. They were found at Jack Hills in the mid-north of Western Australia. Finding really ancient rocks is difficult on Earth because the planet's crust is constantly being weathered by wind and water erosion and through seduction back into the mantle due to plate tectonics. This means that most of the planet's surface rocks are at very best only 1 or 2 billion years old, and most are much younger than that. One of the study's authors, Max Drolmer from Curtin University, says finding much older crust suggests that something special must have occurred during this epoch in Earth's history. The newly discovered section of ancient crust was found in sediment from the Scott Coastal Plain south of Perth, which eroded out of much deeper Australian continental rocks. The authors reached their conclusion by undertaking radioactive dating of zircon crystals found in the rocks. Zircons are extremely durable crystals that resist melting and erosion once they're formed. That means they often survive the very rocks they formed in. The authors vaporized the zircons using powerful lasers, then analyzed the decay ratios between two radioactive elements they contained, uranium to lead and lutetium to hafnium. Because these elements radioactively decay at set rates, they can be used as geological clocks to date the zircon minerals they were formed in. The authors then used Earth observation satellite data to learn exactly where these minerals came from. Because Earth's crust varies in thickness, gravity varies slightly across the planet's surface. And by measuring these variations, the authors identified a thick section of crust around the Scott River region, which is part of the massive 100,000 square kilometre Yogan Craton, which covers a third of the state and includes Jack Hills to the north. This ancient crust is buried tens of kilometres below today's surface and includes a boundary area associated with gold and iron ore deposits. Understanding the formation of crust 4 billion years ago will help researchers better understand how our continents first formed. This is Space Time. Still to come, a new hypothesis for the origin of Earth's water. And it works fine in the movies, but could suspended animation, in other words stasis, really work for long-distance spaceflight? All that and more still to come on Space Time. hypothesis published earlier this year suggests that Earth received its life-giving water during its formation in the protoplanetary disk from which the Sun and Solar System were created 4.6 billion years ago. The findings, which were reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, were based on a detailed evaluation of the hydrogen to deuterium ratios in water of an ancient meteorite as old as the solar system itself. Water is essential for life as we know it. It's made up of molecules of hydrogen and oxygen. A hydrogen atom is usually made up of a single proton in its nucleus orbited by an electron. A heavier version of hydrogen called deuterium adds a neutron to the proton in the nucleus. 
For years, scientists pondering the origins of Earth's water were convinced it must have come to the Earth through comet and asteroid impacts, which reached their peak some 3.9 billion years ago during a period known as the Late Heavy Bombardment. This was caused by the migration of the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn from the inner solar system out to their current locations. Now, the reasoning behind this water origin hypothesis was the enormous amounts of heat generated during the Earth's formation, which saw the early proto-Earth as nothing more than a seething, bubbling magma ocean, especially after the Mars-sized planet Theia slammed into it, blowing off so much ejecta, it eventually coalesced to form the Moon. So, with the Earth being nothing more than a molten magma ocean, it was thought any water that would have been there would have evaporated away. So, how did the water get here? Well, astronomers always thought that comets, being basically big muddy snowballs which contain a lot of water, may be a good contender. However, the problem is, when astronomers began analysing the composition of water inside comets, they found that the hydrogen to deuterium isotope ratios were different from that of Earth's water. It turns out, the further away from the Sun you get, the less deuterium water contains and comets originate a long way from the Sun in the outer solar system. So, if Earth's water didn't come from comets, where did it originate? And this is where geochemist Jerome Allion from the French National Museum of Natural History comes in. He was studying the 4.57 billion-year-old Efremovka meteorite, which was discovered in Kazakhstan in 1962, when he analysed the hydrogen in its calcium-aluminium-rich inclusions, or CAIs, using a new technique involving a focused ion beam. This meteorite analysis showed that during the first 200,000 years of the solar system's existence, and before the planetesimals had formed, two large gas reservoirs existed. One of these reservoirs contained the solar gas from which the matter in our solar system ended up condensing. The other was apparently rich in water from a massive influx of interstellar material that fell in towards the inner solar system just as the protostellar envelope was collapsing to form the Sun and before the Earth had fully formed. And fascinatingly, this interstellar water had a similar isotopic composition to Earth's water. A full report on the discovery is contained in the current issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. The magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally, says this suggests that the water was present in the early solar system from its very inception and before the Earth was formed. G'day Stuart, yeah, so where did Earth get all its water? You know, we're in a water world, we've got all these huge oceans, water everywhere, we've got this magnificent water cycle, we've got Antarctica down there, we've got polar ice caps, we've got clouds, we've we're, we really are a water planet. So where did all this water come from? And for a long, long time, people thought, well, Earth must have uh, been bombarded in its early years by lots of comets, and there would have been far more comets around billions of years ago than there are now, and comets are made basically mostly of, of water ice. So bombardment of comets could have brought a lot of water to the Earth because the thing is, when the Earth formed in the early days of the solar system, everything would have been really hot. The whole environment would have been incredibly hot and it would have been difficult, if not impossible, for water to form pools and lakes and oceans and things on a hot, on a hot planet in a hot environment. So the, the thinking was that after things cooled down a bit, this comet bombardment came along and that's where we got all our water. So that, that, sort of, that was the idea for a very, very long time. And the difficulty is that there's some Researchers come up now and they suggested that it wasn't courtesy of a bombardment of comets. We might actually have formed with the water in place. And the reason for this is that there are a couple of different kinds of hydrogen atoms, okay? And it turns out that much of the type of hydrogen in Earth's water molecules doesn't match the type of hydrogen, uh, or at least the ratio of the two types of hydrogen that you find in comets. Because comets from way out there in the distant part of the solar system are sort of like frozen time capsules and they're thought to um, encapsulate the conditions that they formed in there so they're sort of like pristine samples of the type of water, frozen water, that they were made with. And the type of water we've got here on Earth, or at least the, the ratio of the different kinds of hydrogen atoms, is slightly different. So scientists have analysed a meteorite that was found in Kazakhstan back in the 1960s. And this meteorite has crystals in it that indicate that it formed in the hot environment of the early solar system, right, where the Earth would have been as well. Now, the scientists have found that the ratio of the two types of hydrogen suggests that the water was already in and on the Earth when it was forming. 
that it matches, you see. And they also think that this particular type of water, or some of it at least, might have actually come from outside the solar system when the solar system was forming and got sort of dragged in and mixed in with all the big cloud of gas and dust from which the sun and all the planets uh, eventually formed as this cloud was collapsing inwards. So that's really interesting. So that we didn't have this. We might have still have had a comet bombardment, but could it have brought enough water of the hydrogen ratio type that we now have? So it looks like we actually formed with the water in place. So we really are the water world and have been for a very, very long time. There was the normal water that formed in the protoplanetary disk and then the second body of water infiltrated into the solar system and, and it's the second body which the Earth's water came from. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's interesting to see how ideas change uh, over decades and decades and decades as new evidence comes along. And get a lot more complicated. Uh, it can get a lot more complicated, but the beauty is that we've got all these new techniques of analysing things these days too. And, you know, ideas tend to sort of stick in science for a very long time and then something will come along and turn it upside down. For instance, Newton's ideas of gravity and all that sort of stuff and that, that stayed that way for a they couple say, hundred years. And then They say that science's progression can be measured in tombstones. In tombstones. Well, you only have to go back probably, what, about 130 years towards the latter part of the 19th century, the late 1800s, where physicists, some physicists at least, were proudly proclaiming all physics is now known. We've yes. sorted the whole thing out. You know, there's nothing more to learn. We got it all. <laughs> all all done. And then, then, you, then along comes relativity and quantum mechanics and, and the atom and all sorts of other things. And yeah, um, what's the pride go up before the fall, the old saying, isn't it? So it's the same thing with, uh, this is not a major one, the, the Earth's water, but the idea had been settled on for a long time that the water came from comets. And the other thing that sort of fed into that too, probably starting in the, I don't know, maybe it was in the 80s or so, was that they started to detect you know, amino acids and things in, in bodies out there in space. And then it was thought that maybe comets brought some of the building blocks of life to Earth as well. So it all seemed to make a lot of sense. And look, comets would have bombarded the Earth too, and some of the water would have come from comets. So maybe they did bring some amino acids and things. But that sort of I, that idea sort of stuck for a very long time until this new evidence came along when we had new investigations and new techniques for investigating um, and analysing um, meteorites and other things that we just simply couldn't do before. So it's sort of episodic the way these sort of scientific ideas go. What they had before was the best idea they can come up with with the information they had at the time. And now we've got a new idea with the best information we've got at this time and who knows, who knows what it's going to be 30 years from now when we, we might have made some huge other discoveries somewhere else. Maybe maybe 30 years from now we will be analysing planets that orbit other stars and be getting all sorts of great information from them and maybe even pictures and be able to sort of see equivalents to Earth out there forming or having already formed or in the process of forming and get some clues then to how our planet formed and the processes that were going on in our neck of the woods about four and a half billion years ago. It's exciting, actually. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. Still to come. It works fine in the movies, but could suspended animation or stasis really work for long-distance space flights? And later in the science report, a new prototype electrolyzer that can convert humidity in the air into hydrogen. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Well, it works great in sci-fi, but in real life, putting someone or something in a stasis that is suspended animation in order to undertake long-distance space flights simply isn't going to work. Chilean researchers set out to investigate whether humans could hibernate like bears, enabling people to remain in stasis during long trips through space that last more than a normal human lifetime. But they found that it's unlikely to work because humans simply wouldn't save enough energy during hibernation. They looked at metabolism during hibernation in mammals, ranging from bats to bears, and say that a gram of tissue in a bat has a similar metabolism to a gram of tissue in a bear during hibernation, despite the bear being nearly 20,000 times bigger. But working out the likely metabolism of a hibernating human based on our mass, they found that we save more energy simply by sleeping than what we would by hibernating. The findings, reported in the Journal of the Proceedings of the Royal Society B, are bad news for sci-fi fans, suggesting that humans will simply never be able to survive in suspended animation during long trips through space. 
A new study has shown that astronauts on long missions experience the equivalent of 10 years of age-related bone density loss even after 12 months of recovery back on Earth. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Scientific Reports, investigated the shin bones of 17 astronauts after being in space and found that people who went on space missions for longer than six months had substantially less bone recovery than those who were in space for less than six months. Altogether, nine of the astronauts studied did not fully recover their shin bone total mass mineral density even after 12 months of recovery. Across all astronauts, those who completed the greatest amount of in-flight deadlift training relative to their individual training pre-flight were identified as part of those who did recover their tibia bone mineral density. This is Space Time. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 